Okay, I think we're live. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to week nine of Introduction to Learning Technologies. Um, I'm Heather Ross, if you're tuning in for the first time, and with me today is my co-teacher in this, Ryan Bano. Say hello, Ryan. Hey, how's everyone and, doing this week? <laughs> and we're going to be talking this week with Darcy Norman from the University of Calgary. Uh, about sort of the bigger considerations when integrating learning technologies. Before we get started, just a reminder that you can post your questions if you're in the course on the discussion forum, and if you're not, you can tweet questions to us using the course hashtag uh, ILT underscore USASK, ILT USASK underscore USASK. Um, and I think we're ready. So Darcy, do you want to give an introduction about who you are and why would we bother having you in? Oh, you bothered. Nice. <laughs> well, I'm Darcy Norman. I am uh, manager of our technology integration group at the University of Calgary's Taylor Institute for Teaching and Learning in our educational development unit. Uh, so we get to do things like working with instructors to integrate technology into the courses. And so it's appropriate technology. It's finding maybe it's a whiteboard, maybe it's something we need to build, maybe it's something off the shelf or a campus platform that we have. Uh, we also support sort of advanced uses of this stuff. So how do you actually use our, our LMS is, D, is uh, D2L, Desire to Learn. How do you actually use that effectively? How do you uh, support your pedagogical needs with the tools that we have? Uh, and so we have a team that supports that, a team, a team members that build stuff. And uh, yeah, a lot of our job is to sort of explore the educationally interesting uses of technology to enhance learning. And so I, we've done a bunch of proge projects with that with developing, uh, implementing D2L in about a year on campus, uh, switching online collaborative platforms. We went from Illuminate to Connect during that year, too. So we've had a lot of changes. We've had a lot of technology selections and deployments. And uh, yeah, it's, been, it's been fun. So I'm willing to talk about anything that hopefully won't get me fired and uh, answer any questions that come up. Great. Uh, I think what we were going to start with was sort of privacy. Now. We most of the tools that we talked about in this course, throughout this course, um, this offering, have been uh, online tools, and so there's social bookmarking, there's Evernote, Google Docs, Twitter, uh, YouTube, all sorts of things like that. A lot of Google products you may have noticed. Um, um, so, what about what do you think that people, sh you know, not be overly paranoid about, but what, what are considerations for using tools that are, things that are in the cloud, period? Well, the big thing is where, who owns the data, and what kind of agreements do you have with the vendor on data retention, on who gets to see the data, on if there are requests from authorities, what, what are the processes, can somebody just walk in and grab it, that kind of thing. When we were switching our learning management system, we had historically hosted it on campus, we, we had Blackboard that we ran in our data center here, and as we switched, we went to D2L and D2L was hosted in the cloud by the vendor. So we had to have a lot of these discussions about it. And in the early days of the selection, um, a prof actually came to me. He's the leading expert in nuclear energy in Western Canada. And some of his students are from Iran and from China and from countries that are, if the data was stored on US servers, he was concerned that they might not be able to travel, that they would actually be part of their, their dossier uh, here's students learning about nuclear energy and the NSA might freak out. So he had very valid concerns. Um, and so we had to, to think about what kinds of things are they going to talk about in the discussion boards. And if it's hosted on a US server, it turns out we're hosted on Canadian servers, so it's less of an issue. It's still somebody has access to it. Um, but they had to think, well, what kind of things do we talk about online, knowing that it's potentially part of somebody's permanent record? And as soon as it's on a server that you don't control yourself, you have to assume that somebody can request access to it without you even knowing about it. So it, you have to think about those things in the back of your mind. Once, you, once it goes online, what happens to the data? What's the life cycle of it? How does it get destroyed at, at the end? What's the retention policies? Who gets to see it? Um, and there's all kinds of privacy and sort of authority matrices that go around that, right? So who, who can request data? Who can respond? Who needs to be informed about it? And a lot of it, too, is we as a university have a higher responsibility, I think, because there's a, uh, a power relationship, right? We're compelling students to do, to do this. Mm -hmm. They join a program, and we then tell them, you know, if you want the degree that you're spending four or five years of your life doing, uh, you need to jump through the hoops that we give you. 
And if our hoops have sort of strings attached that you know, there are, there's governmental watchdogs or whatever watching the data, we need to be really, really careful what we're essentially forcing our students to do. And that's why a lot of our stuff is self-hosted. That's why we do try to host things. If, if it's with vendors, it's with Canadian vendors on Canadian soil. But even that isn't clean. We need to have agreements with the vendors on what happens to the data. Mm -hmm. um, but we also do host a lot of the stuff ourselves. So we have data centers on campus, and we host blogs and wikis and all kinds of applications here. Does that make the data more secure? Maybe not, because CSIS can actually walk onto campus and walk out with your servers. So the privacy thing is kind of a red herring, but we need to kind of reduce the number of access points to your stuff. So I, I try to remember there was some phenomenal number somebody mentioned the other day about how many years it would take people to actually read all the user agreements that we just check the box to and move on. Well, I um, read every line of every ULI that, that comes up. It took me 16 hours to update iOS. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that's a good point. And, and the ULIs themselves are not human readable. They're written, written by lawyers for lawyers. Yeah. And, and so, obviously, they know everyone's just going to click through. But what also happens is the companies can change the terms of privacy. We've seen Facebook do it, where all of a sudden things that were private are not private. Uh, we've seen it with LMSs that are hosted in a certain data center, and oh, next year they've actually changed their business, and now it's hosted somewhere else. And it's just part of the agreement that the university signs, but there's also that at the, at the individual level. Uh, we've actually seen this with, uh, with D2L. So one of the items that we licensed with ours was called Campus Life. It's their platform to build mobile apps. And it was using a framework that they built. And then we found out just recently, just in the last few months, that they've changed how they do it. And they've actually outsourced that to another company. Great. So now there's a US company who's now controlling this thing. We don't have direct act access to the stuff. We had no say in the thing. And our response was basically, we agree, or we terminate that part of the, uh, of the license. And that's why we get a little bit nervous about some of these vendor agreements, because things can change. But that's the nature of software in 2015. Right. Right. Brian, do you have any further questions on the privacy issue? Uh, that was pretty well covered. There's nothing really okay. that's springing to mind at the moment. But. OK. I know that you had some on other topics that you wanted to bring up. So, um, Well, sure. You've kind of brought up that uh, at the UFC there, you guys recently changed um, LMSs. So just you talked about there's kind of the privacy issues with that. What are some of the other you know major considerations that come into effect when you're looking at the change like that? Oh yeah. So there, well, I mean the biggest one is cost, right? Everyone looks at how much does it cost to license the LMS. So when I started that role, there was I was kind of came into leading that implementation from the side, and then I wound up being the guy sort of I was the D2L transition guy. But when we went through the whole thing. Previously, when we were hosting, a lot of the costs were invisible. So we had the license for software, but we also didn't really account for things like the data center cost, the cost of the people who update the code, the cost of people who back up the stuff, um, all the way down to janitorial staff to make sure the data center is clean, to security staff to make sure no one's walking away with service. So all these costs were buried, and we had no idea what the actual cost was. When you go to an external vendor, all those costs are suddenly added up, and it looks <laughs> like it's insanely more expensive. And I don't think it actually was that much more expensive. I mean, it's obviously with inflation, but having those costs visible uh, was kind of an eye-opener for me. I thought it was expensive in the first place, and then all of a sudden this was many times more than that. But having all these costs uh, exposed, I think, is actually a good thing, um, because that builds the case to say, if this is a real thing that we have to worry about, let's make sure we pay it for it, make sure it's sustainable, make sure the budget, and we're not having to do the, the bake sale or passing the hat to pay for the license next year. Uh, which was kind of what we were doing before. We, because the costs were buried, it wasn't an actual cost, and we weren't keeping up to date, so our licenses were expiring, we're, our servers weren't updated. And now that it's exposed and someone else is managing that, we have to keep up to date, and we have to make sure this is a real thing on a very high-profile budget, and that it's taken care of. So there's that. There's the sort of ownership, there's the costs exposed, there's the even the maintenance. When you go with an external vendor, you don't have to worry about, is Red Hat patched? Is the latest SSL security bug, is that taken care of? Well, no, it's, they, they worry about that. On the flip side, we don't have access to the code. So if we want to tweak, we have to use their API, which restricts what we can do to it. If we want to look at the data, we can't just run a SQL query and do our own reports on it. We have to use the tools that they give us. 
So on the one hand, it frees us from having to do a lot of the grunt work, uh, which is awesome because we can have our people doing more interesting things, but it also restricts what we can do because we have to use the tools that the vendor gives us. So there's pros and cons to both. Uh, again, we'd been hosting our own LMS for about a decade before we switched, and it was cool because we could just you know write a few lines of code or have somebody in IT write a few lines. I didn't get to actually do that. Um, but they could. You know, if we came up with some freaky, how many people are using discussions in the blah, blah, whatever, he could write a, a piece of code, boom, here's, here's the thing. Um, having to hand that responsibility over to a vendor was kind of a culture shock for us, but I think you know, we're a year in, in after everyone's transitioned, and I think we're actually we're okay with that. It just means we need to be more thoughtful about what data we want, and in our case, the vendor's actually really good. If we come up with requests for custom data, they'll generate it for us. So we're more on the, what do you want to do with this stuff? So long rambling way of saying there's costs, there's <laughs> uh, maintenance and responsibility and ownership, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we still support everything. So we have several tiers of support. We have a support center within IT that does the frontline support. They escalate within IT. And then if things get really complicated or pedagogical, they sort of escalate over to us in the Taylor Institute, our educational development unit. And my team will sit down and, and do the really sort of complicated uh, high-end support. And so having that in-house, I think, is critical. If we were to outsource support, that would be a fatal thing, because we, we need to own that relationship with our instructors. Uh, so there are things that, you, that are commodities, essentially. An LMS is a commodity. It really doesn't matter what tool you pick. They're all basically the same. Um, so you want things that don't matter as much, just outsource them. The things that you care about, the relationships with your instructors, with your students, with your what the things that you're trying to do as a community, that's the stuff that you have to own and you have to do it yourself. So I I in a previous life was kind of like evangelical about open source, let's host everything, let's do it ourselves. And I went through through this process. I don't even know what language the thing is written in. It doesn't matter. Someone's taking care of that. I don't I don't care. It could be punch cards and that you have to compile it daily. I don't care. <laughs> that's not something that's interesting to the, to the university. What's interesting to the university is how it's supporting teaching and learning. And because we were able to sort of push away a lot of the responsibility of updating code, and database, and all that kind of nonsense that really isn't core to what a university does, we can have our folks focus more on the support, on the interesting pedagogical uses of the stuff. We can have IT staff, instead of writing raw queries, they can actually be doing more interesting things like developing new tools that aren't commodities. Um, and my development uh, 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 staff member does that as well. We're able to do new work as opposed to maintaining existing work. So that kind of frees us up, which is, is pretty cool. Great. Yeah, that was that was yeah very interesting. I, I hadn't really thought about the uh, kind of the queries into things and how that's different if you have a hosted in the cloud or not. So that's a that's a good point you brought up. Yeah, as soon as you go to a shared service, strangely they don't like giving you access to the actual server. I don't know, something about security. Or, yeah. So <laughs> you need to use the tool. And it's a good thing, right? Because then if you're on a shared data center, you know someone else, other clients yeah. don't, don't have access to the same server. So on the one hand, it feels kind of like you're handcuffed, but it is a really important thing that yeah. our data is sandboxed. We can't have access to it, and nobody else can either. Right. So you're talking like institutional right now. Um, but what what do you think are the biggest considerations? Let's say you have um, you have an instructor who wants to do something, and you don't currently have a tool that supports that. How do you work with them on um, finding something that's going to be appropriate that isn't necessarily something that you're officially supporting? Right, that's sustainable too, right? So we have the problem yeah. of the. And this is. It's okay. Your presentation is not on my campus, so I can maybe talk a little less delicately. We have <laughs> that are haves and have-nots, right? And the faculties that have, the faculties of money, they will hire their own developers and their own data centers, and they'll build whatever they want. And they have changes of leadership, and all of a sudden they have these white elephants. Nobody knows what the thing is or how it's built and all this. And so they're, they're realizing that's actually not sustainable. Yes, they can sort of do what they want, but it's not a way to... That's not how a university runs. And so what we try to do is use... Information tech, our central services like information technologies and support units like that are providing the core services of we have a data center. If you want to host an application, we have a place for it to go. Don't hire a contractor and build some custom thing and have them running it on a 386 under somebody's desk. 
um, there are best practices, and we have within IT we have uh, a team that will consult on what those what those are. How do you actually build stuff? How do you get it hosted properly? So IT does sort of the enterprise stuff, uh, but also sort of frees up actually my group. Uh, so we have a, a developer, Kevin Sato, who's our, our 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 developer, and he will actually sit down and build stuff. Uh, and again, because he's freed up, not having to worry about sort of maintaining thing, commodity stuff like the LMS, he's able to do things. Uh, he built our, our badges platform, badges.ucalgary.ca, uh, was something that we couldn't have done if we were focused on sort of the boring maintenance stuff. Because he's freed up to do this, he built this platform, and now we've got faculties basically knocking on our door. How do we do this micro-credentialing badges systems? And because we were able to do a pilot, and evidence-based pilots. We're actually gathering data on how do you use these tools for professional development, for integration with courses. Um, so we'll build tools, do pilot evaluations, tie it to scholarship and, and, uh, and uh, sort of the academic context. And then we can go out and recruit. And, have, and eventually, we have, we're getting the problem now where people are finding out and they're coming to us. Uh, so we, uh, Natasha Kenny, our director, keeps saying, think big, but start small. And so if you focus on these big institutional, let's change the world, it kind of becomes paralyzing. So think big, but you're starting on building these small tools, on pilot projects, on do-it-yourself stuff, and then working on, well, how does that tie into bigger pictures? Um, in a previous life, I did a, a presentation with Brian Lamb and Ellen Levine. And it was basically what started me into education technology. And it was based on uh, the small pieces loosely joined model. So instead of having this big monolith that does everything, and in order to get a change, you've got to fire up a project and make sure you've got change management. No, small pieces. Build a small thing, integrate it with other things. And that's sort of the model we're looking at. What, how do we use the platforms, the common things, to build small pieces that tie together, and instead of building a giant thing that is a learning management system that also does e-portfolios and badges and all this other stuff, how do we build things then connect them together? And that's the model we're looking at. And then we're, when we're working with people in other faculties. We're not, how do we build it for you? It's, what are your needs? Who has similar needs? And what can be built to meet all of these things in, in, in a common way so there's not a bunch of one-off tools that are not sustainable? Uh, a good example of that, we have a tool called the Student Sign-Up Manager. And it was actually started as a research project years ago, probably close to a decade ago in our faculty of engineering. And they needed a way to manage uh, what they call a capstone design program. They've got students going through the engineering program. At the end of the year, they need to do a big project on nanotechnology, solar energy, wh whatever the thing is. And they needed a way to organize students selecting these things, voting what's their top choice, their second choice, their third, third choice, and assigning them into groups. It's something that the LMS of, at the time doesn't do. D2L still doesn't do. So we built a tool that does that, handles that, that selection of topics really well. What happened was our faculty of nursing found out about it, and they use it now for similar things. Education uses it uh, in a small scale for practicum placements. How do you pick which school and which subject you're doing? You turn the crank, and it does the group selection. Um, education is using it. Uh, social work is using it. We've got a lot of faculties playing with this tool that started off as a small pilot within engineering by building this tool as being generalizable and not as a big monolith, but as a generalizable tool that's not just custom what are your, your own individual needs? What are our needs? How do we do this together? And that's kind of that's the approach. How do we use our, prop, our, our platforms and the things that, that are common in a way that supports the individual needs as opposed to just being one-offs? What do you tell faculty who come to you and they want to use a third-party uh, cloud-based tool that isn't something that is hosted you, by you? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so we. One of the problems is we don't have clear policies around this. So on the one hand, I'd like to say, yes, go ahead and do whatever you want. We don't, because I mean, it comes to the whole conversation of we have uh, a group on campus that will do uh, privacy impact assessments. And so that needs to be done, depending on what kind of student data goes on there. So I can't just say, go ahead and use Cloud Tool X, or use Basecamp for your project management. Depending on what data goes in, that may or may not be appropriate. But I also realize that. People are going to do what they're going to do anyway. We have faculties running entire collaborative platforms on Basecamp. I don't know what their privacy is. So there's that. We also try to provide that kind of thing in a more managed way. So ucalgaryblogs.ca was started as that. So people were going off to WordPress, going off to blogger.com, all these other things. And there was no sense of data retention. There was no sense of responsibility, no sense of connection, no institutional backups of the stuff. 
And so I basically installed a copy of WordPress on a server here, on an IT managed server, providing the exact same things that the cloud service provides, um, but in a more, not responsible, that's not the right word, but in a more sort of managed way. We're not saying don't use the thing, but if you're going to use it and you're going to have student data on it, here's a way to do it safely. Uh, same with the wiki. Yes, you can go off and do it wherever you want, or you can do it at wiki.ucalgary.ca. Everything's backed up on IT servers, but it's using the full media wiki, so it's the same software that they're running on, on Wikipedia. We have it here. Go ahead and go, go for it. Wait. But we also have profs that say, well, that doesn't suit my needs. And so they go off to... Uh, uh, drawing a blank on the name, but there's a wiki platform that was very commonly used, and they just changed the terms, and so now it, what was free for education is not, or there's ads, or there's other things. So I try to talk about those issues. If you're doing it somewhere else, know that you may or may not have long-term control of your thing. So make sure you've got a, how do you get your stuff out? How do you export your stuff? How do you keep it? Do you need it a year from now, two years from now, five years from now? And if so, how are you going to make sure you've got that? Um, so just sort of informing about the issues, knowing that, especially with academic freedom, people are going to do whatever they want to do anyway, um, but trying to provide options so they don't feel like they have to go on their own. Right. Um, we got a question from Nancy Turner on Twitter, and she asked, how essential do you think the traditional LMS will be in the future with the small pieces loosely joined model? Yeah, so that's a, a weird kind of dichotomy, right? So and there's this, this tension, right? You want to use all these small little pieces, but I had this sort of epiphany, I think it was a couple of years ago, and I, I call it my, my law of ed, of ed tech. And whatever you build, even if it's a small piece that's loosely joined, by the time it's adapted and you have all these other use cases and things that it has to do, it basically turns into an LMS. No matter what you start with, no matter how open it is, as you add use cases, as it gets bigger and more people use it, it turns into an LMS. So my epiphany was great, let's use an LMS for that. We'll always have a need for that. There will always be a need for grades and having syllabus and all this sort of boring administrative stuff. That sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but the LMS is really good for that. So use the LMS for, for its strengths. I, I don't think it's going away. Let's use it. But let's use things like uh, uh, the learning, the LTI specification to integrate tools into it. Do things that are interesting elsewhere. Use the LMS for what it's good for, but don't be limited by it. Uh, figure out what are the activities that you need to do with with your class, as both as instructor as students, and what tools are best to support that, and then find ways to integrate that if needed with the with the LMS. That really is I mean, that's where the authentication, that's where access control, that's where all this you know, reporting to the student information system, all that stuff happens. If you don't have an, an LMS, that means you need to either do that yourself, which sucks, or you've got to build that into every other tool that you use, which is not possible. So I think the LMS is going to be here to stay. It may or may not be a good thing, but use it for its strengths and then do more interesting things wherever you need to. Great. Brian? <laughs> um, I don't know. don't have anything on the top of my head. OK. Uh, there was, you had been talking about bandwidth. We were having a little chat before um, we started. Yeah. And I We've we've had a few, we've had some people on the discussion boards post that they were having issues with accessing the Google Hangouts and some of the videos because of limits on bandwidth where they are. Now we have we have learners in this course. There's about two thousand people registered um, from all over the world, and so there's different circumstances for compared to how we are in uh, a major center. I can't believe I said that about Saskatoon. Yes, a major center <laughs> um, uh, compared to um, more uh, developing areas or even rural areas within Canada or the United States. So how do you deal with, you You have students who are at a distance, how do you deal with students who there may be issues with bandwidth or there may or other access issues? Yeah, so we have very distributed programs. We actually have a campus in, in uh, Cotter, in, in Doha, so we actually have uh, faculty of nursing over there and it's, I don't know how many dozen time zones off. So even things like when we have D2L upgraded, we pick a good time that's for our 31,000 students here. That's not the best time for the couple thousand students in the Middle East because their time zones are different. Their week starts on a different day. Uh, so our, our schedules usually to do the updates on the weekend happens to coincide with the beginning of their first day of the, of the work week. So there's time zone considerations. Um, bandwidth. Previously, we had uh, Blackboard and Illuminate hosted on campus. 
um, which meant that if you were off campus, you were likely going through the commercial internet pipe, which was a very, it was a straw for a lot of people coming onto campus. It's a very thin pipe. When we shifted to D2L being hosted by the vendor, it's hosted in their Toronto data center with huge pipe connections to the commercial internet. So for most users, they're finding uh, much better connections to our, our LMS when they're off campus. We also have uh, a, a fat pipe connection between us and the data center. So when you're on campus, it's still not bad either. It's not as good as being on campus, having the hosting here. But most of the people that are really using D2L are off campus anyway. Uh, so for those, they're better. We do have students all over the uh, you know, middle and far east as well. So we have students in Pakistan taking our education program. We have our MBA program all over the world. Um, and we're finding that as long as they have, you can't have a 28.8 dial-up modem anymore. Um, so as long as they've got an actual internet connection, they're finding it's decent wherever they are, um, especially the connections to uh, D2L. Will they be able to do HD video conferencing from you know internet cafe and wherever they are? Uh, that's probably the limiting factor. Um, there's really not a lot we can do about that unless we are recording things that we can distribute after the fact, so making things asynchronous, uh, which we're trying to do more of. We're looking at doing things like uh, we're piloting not lecture capture, but sort of event uh, and uh, session recording um, so that we can then provide those if it takes overnight to download where they're going to view it, uh, or can you send physical media? We haven't looked at that, but I mean, there are other options once you have it recorded. Um, but being able to support both synchronous and asynchronous, I think, is the key for that. Because if people are having low bandwidth, they're having time zone differences, they can't be expected to have you know, a Google Hangout with multiple HD streams, or an Adobe Connect session with multiple HD streams, and screen sharing, and all this other stuff. But if these things are recorded, that breaks away the time constraint, and then the bandwidth becomes less of an issue. It's still always going to be an issue, but you can only do so much. Even, sorry, sorry. Just uh, continuing on that, I was even thinking of like in the classroom technologies, so like with student response systems, things like like that. You know, the consideration of you know, do we have enough you know Wi-Fi spots in this room to be able to actually get students on there responding to questions, things like that. So. Have you seen the revised Maslow's hierarchy of needs? <laughs> um, that has like the triangle and then Wi-Fi at the bottom, and power underneath that. <laughs> There's two layers been added to Maslow, and I think it's absolutely correct. So as long as you know, why first you need power, and absolutely. So classrooms, we've got power plugs everywhere. You, if you walk into class, you see extension cords, whatever. Uh, our new spaces are going to have power plugs everywhere. Uh, so that, there's that. We're also on campus, really beefing up our Wi-Fi. That's like the number one complaint. This, we just had our student union elections. That was like the number one thing <laughs> on posters. Uh, our posters are now Photoshop competitions, not actual. But the ones that actually did talk about issues, uh, Wi-Fi was one of the big things. Um, and our, we, I mean, when our wireless network was designed on campus, we were one of the pioneers of it. We were one of the first campuses that had an actual campus-wide wireless network. But that was how many years ago? And that was before people had you know, fancy phones and iPads and all these things that suck up IP addresses. And you know, now people walk in, they've got two, three, four, five devices. When they open them up in a classroom, they reserve an IP address for probably an hour after they close it again. So if you have a classroom with, I think our biggest classroom has 430 seats. Uh, so if you have one class in there, you've got to support those 430 people times two or three devices, so your 1,500 ac uh, accesses, plus probably another hour. So you're looking 3,000 seats, essentially, 300 uh, connections to the, to the wireless network. So orders of magnitude higher than what the wireless network originally was. Uh, IT's realized that years ago, and so we've been going through as a university and strategically upgrading our networks. We're, we're now way higher, so we're actually building beyond what the, the current needs are. So building the, the campus wire, it's also insanely expensive, and it takes a lot of time. So no matter how vocal we are about, yes, we're making it better, it's never fast enough, and it's never you know, high, high performance enough. So and that's something yeah, I, that like, instructors need to think about, too, right? Because I know that we've got instructors here that it's like, oh, I found this, you know, student response system tool that I want to use, and you know, you don't really think about those considerations when you want to use it, right? You just think, well, it's on the internet, it'll work. Right? Well, and the wrinkle we have, so we have a policy here where students can't be be made to pay for things that are used for assessment within a course. 
Uh, so a tool that's used for an exam or feedback within a class, they, they, we can't make students buy these things, which meant physical clickers, the remote control things, well, we can't make students pay $30 a semester so they can, they can answer questions in class. And so our provost was able to get a multi-year license for Top Hat, which is the wireless-based, uh, uh, basically a web service, a cloud service for student response systems. When we rolled that out, the first response from instructors was, well, wait a minute, the, wi the Wi-Fi doesn't support that. So, well, yeah, you're right. So we had to go through and beef up a whole bunch of classrooms to support that. Um, so there's that. We've got things like uh, lots of people are bringing Apple TVs and that kind of thing, so they can push things wirelessly to podiums. We have people using Google Chrome, the little dongles. We've got. Uh, we're looking in some of our new places, having things like Crestron Air Media, which is wireless connections between a device and a and a screen or a projector. That takes a lot of con of Wi-Fi bandwidth. It takes a lot of connections, and we absolutely have to beef up to do that. And we know it's just going to get worse and worse, better and better, right? We're going to have more needs for wireless. And they're going to be like, well, why are, why is power not wireless? How do we do this? Well, yeah, that's the, part <laughs> of the next conversation. <laughs> Uh, Darcy, we've got two questions that came in on the discussion forum while we've been talking, so I wanted to get to those. Uh, the first one is from Alex, and Alex asks, can you talk a bit about working with those faculty who are reluctant to adopt new useful technologies? What has worked and what hasn't worked? And thanks. Yeah, so there's like a bell curve, right? So there's going to be, I don't know what the percents are, but there's going to be on the sort of high end of the curve, there's going to be the people that are going to use stuff no matter what, you know, get out of my way, let me use my whatever. There's going to be the big chunk in the middle that are they're not reluctant, but I mean they're, they're going to use it as, as they can. They're going to use the institutional support, and then there's sort of like the lower thing at the at the, at the low end. I, I think the numbers aren't that high, but there's going to be a group that are very resistant. They're not they're not Luddites. These are people that are, you know, they're they're PhDs. They're experts in their field. They're they've got huge time constraints to do research, to do community, all this other stuff. And then they're saying, oh, now you want me to do a new whatever the thing is, right? So they've got they feel this burden and. They resist. They say, well, yeah, I'll get there when I get there, and it, I, I don't actually need it. So my personal take is this isn't the, this isn't the official University of Calgary stance. Is I don't focus on them, because if we do, all of our resources are in, on that. How do we help the people that are resistant? So I prefer to focus on the people that are sort of willing, willing adopters, right? the big chunk in the middle, the people that will do it. How can we support them, and how can we really support the people at the high end who are the the innovators, the, they're the, the people in the faculties that are the patient zero, right? They're going to be, what's the new thing? How do I actually support it for changing how I teach as opposed to here's a shiny bauble and now I'm, I'm innovating. These are the people that are really critically reflecting on what does teaching mean, on what does what is learning. If we focus on that, we get really good competency on what's needed there. We can then sort of raise up that big middle chunk and then eventually the people at the end will adopt it. They'll see it as not a big scary thing that's a time drain. Um, and, and they do adopt these new practices. Again, it's not about the technology. It's about the practices that the technologies support or enable, right? Mm -hmm. um, the people who are resisting, if they're still succeeding at having a, a, a productive learning environment in their, in their courses, I don't care if they use technology or not. That's not the interesting thing. The interesting things are the students learning. If their students are learning, great. If they're not learning, well, that's another conversation to have. But making them adopt technology is not going to solve the issue of, of is it a good learning environment. Um, so ideally, you want to support everybody, but you probably don't have the resources to do that. I mean, my team, we've got four people, including myself, in, in, in our EDU uh, uh, technology integration team. We're a campus of about 40,000 people. So if we were to focus on people who are resisting, and we can't. We need to be really strategic on how do we support sort of the, the innovators and use that to, to help gently nudge everyone else. Uh, the long rambling way to say, I don't know how to support the people that are highly resistant unless you've got a whole bunch of people. Uh, one thing that did help when we did the LMS transition, because that was a mandatory thing, right? We're taking system X and replacing with system Y on this date and you're kind of getting on board because that's it's not optional. One thing that really changed it, we, we uh, in several faculties, adopted what they called a coach's model. And so we had the support teams as usual, but they hired uh, grad students within each department to basically become the expert on the use of the LMS, the implementation of it, 
within the context of whatever the department was. So you've got a grad student, say, in geology, who understands what it's like to teach geology, who has really high training on the uh, on the on the tools that are available, and they're also given training on coaching and mentoring. So it's not just about the tech. And yes, I've read the manual, but I know how to gently guide someone who is an expert in their field and guide them into it. And that absolutely changed the, the implementation for those faculties. Um, so having that sort of high touch thing can help. It can be extremely expensive. Uh, we have a campus strategy called the Strategic Framework for Learning Technologies. And one of the recommendations in it uh, was that we adopt that coach's model across the entire campus. And it was looking for something, I think it was $1.6 million a year to do that. And we just, you might have heard the, the Alberta provincial budget is probably not optimistic. And that was one of the first things I think that was sort of taken off the table. Uh, it's very expensive to provide that level of support. So we're looking at more community models. How do we provide resources so that people, not just instructors, people are able to help themselves so that we can showcase what's going on so they can see themselves in that innovation, in that success. How do we help the community to support itself as opposed to having to hold everybody's hands and, and, and lead them uh, in that way? So community support, providing the high touch when available is absolutely essential. That Our D2L transition would have probably failed if we weren't able to do that. Um, so when we're able to make the case for strategic funding, it is there. Um, it's harder to make the case for that as an operational, as an ongoing thing. Uh, and looking at these one-time versus operational operational costs is kind of an eye-opener. That was a new thing for me. I don't know if I answered the question. I think that there was a whole bunch of things you answered. <laughs> in there, uh, including one from another one from Nancy Turner that came in on Twitter. She was asking, I'd love to hear about strategies you use to engage faculty in use of tech for pedagogic gain. And I do think you touched on that throughout what you were saying. One thing we've got, so we actually were really helping to support at the Taylor Institute. We're, we're positioned to become the uh, essentially a community center for teaching and learning, right? So this is where instructors from all 14 faculties can come and basically share. And we've been really fortunate that we have some awesome instructors who come and lead sessions. We have one from uh, from our Workland School of Education. Jennifer Locke does these sessions on uh, signature pedagogies. What are the interesting things for teaching for STEM, for science, technology, engineering, and math? What are the things you can do to support that? And having people from engineering come and come to those sessions, but also having people from nursing, kinesiology, all these other faculties, they come and they learn from this. And we're having a lot of really awesome success with getting this community going. It's a long haul. Um, it's we've, We're about a year in as being an institute. We're a brand new institute. Um, and it's the kind of thing where you can't mandate people be a community. You are now a community, and but by having these sessions and basically giving people the, the opportunity to come share with each other, but also see that they are having success themselves, that, that success isn't only what's happening at other institutions. So really focusing on, on showcasing what's happening here, getting people to come and share and, and support each other, and realize that they're all being awesome in their own ways. One of the things we're doing to support that is we have a Taylor Institute um, sort of facilitates the University of Calgary Awards for Teaching and Learning. And we just did, I think it was our third year, we just just wrapped it, wrapped it up, the, the uh, ceremonies later this month. And absolutely amazing. Uh, uh, in order to be nominated, uh, instructors have to pr produce a dossier, a teaching dossier, of what, what kinds of things they're doing that's interesting as teachers, uh, including reflection, critical ref reflection on what they're doing, uh, on where they want to go, have feedback from students, have support letters from within their faculty, from other ins and just seeing these portfolios that are put in is absolutely amazing. Um, and then just knowing that other instructors know that that kind of awesomeness is going on campus. So that, I think, is really essential. Because uh, otherwise, you get this, I mean, we're a new university. We're just coming up on our 50th anniversary. And for the first 48 years, it was very much all, we're just University of Calgary. You know, we're not Harvard. We're not UBC. We're just, we're just little us. And what's, we're feel, what I'm feeling now is when I talk to people, there's kind of a sea change. And because we have this, this really optimistic and uh, energizing institutional vision, we've got this eyes high mandate. We're going to be a, a top five research intensive university by basically next year this time. Um, having that as an institutional goal and having all of the instructors, all of the staff members see themselves in and seeing the students realizing, oh, this isn't a little backwater school. We actually are aiming high and we're, we're going to reach it. 
having those goals is really important, but also sharing the successes and not being so humble. That's yeah. something we struggle with. Yeah, we have um, we have our own here at the because Ryan and I are out of the Teaching and Learning Center here at the Guatemala Center, um, and it's the same thing that we facilitate and we help put on the celebration of teaching, which for us will be the end of April, beginning of May. Is it May first, <laughs> Ryan? Uh, May first. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, I'm sure Nancy yeah. will correct me on Twitter if I'm wrong. Friday, May first. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, we do. We have really been pushing on that on this this celebration, and and we're we're putting together another event to really showcase innovation that's going on in teaching uh, across a few different areas, including uh, curriculum and um, distributed learning and open education, and and so we're looking at at that same thing and how do we show off um, some of the, the great stuff that's going on, on on our campus and I think that is really important in an institution regardless of whether it's uh, higher ed or K-12 to I, I, I do think that it's important for people to see what great things are going on right in their own backyard. Yeah, one of the other interesting things we're doing to support that is a lot of the times this teaching even was kind of bolted on. Yes, I'm here as a researcher and I'll teach because I have to, whatever, it's not important. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to focus on it because I'm not going to get tenure because of it. Uh, and that's changing. We're actually changing our academic promotion policies. So teaching is important and you will not get tenure if you're not a good teacher, if you don't have evidence, if you don't have a dossier that supports that you're a good teacher. So changing the tenure and promotion is extremely important because now instructors, all faculty members know teaching is important. I had better be focusing on this. It's not just something I'll do on the side of my desk. So we've got that. We also have strategic funding essentially. We have uh, a Taylor Institute grants which are collaborative grants that are your chance of succeeding with these grant applications are much higher if you're collaborative so multiple faculties, multiple instructors, multiple pedagogy, whatever you're going to do and the things are open and shared and so we're strategically feeding money as an institution at new innovation projects to support let's figure out new things, let's develop new things Let's share it. One of the, the requirements is that you share it at our annual uh, uh, teaching and learning conference, as well as other uh, uh, regional, national, international conferences where appropriate. So really, you know, strategically supporting innovation. Here's money. Do it. Be awesome about it. Connect it back to the scholarship. Make right. sure it's evidence-based. Make sure you're not just you know, buying a shiny thing and look, I'm innovating. No, show us how that's affecting teaching, uh, because that's the and, and learning, because that's the interesting thing. We don't. We buy a lot of shiny things. It's not what it's about. It's about how we improve right. learning, and it's really awesome seeing that we're actually we're strategically funding the innovation to support the learning, as opposed to just buy a bunch of stuff. Yeah, we did get another question on the discussion board from Tim, uh, and Tim says or asks, "You mentioned relationships with faculty among the important things that outsourcing some of the technical stuff frees you to focus on." Are there any tips or approaches you found particularly effective for building those relationships and staying aware of what faculty are doing, their needs, etc.? This is an important one because I think that we all struggle with how do we know, how do we really stay in touch with what people are doing because maybe there's some great stuff going on that we don't know about or somebody who wants to do something and they don't know that we can provide that support to them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Tim. Good question. So. There's a couple ways, and I think they're both required, they're mandatory. So there's the sort of top-down, right? You've got the university governance policy uh, uh, committees and stuff. We have a teaching and learning committee on campus. It's chaired by our vice provost teach and learning, and the members are basically all the associate deans teaching and learning from all the 14 faculties and some other reps. So there's the top-down that we share at those meetings. I, I'm one, uh, one of the reps uh, from the EDU. And we share what are the faculties doing, what are their needs, what are the issues. And so there's that, that top down and these, the, the associate deans then sort of kind of fan out in their faculties. So we have really amazing top down support. Our provost is extremely supportive about that kind of thing. So we have access at the top level to deans and associate deans and all that kind of thing at the faculty leadership level. We also have sort of coming from the other side, we provide, because we do provide the high end pedagogical and technical support. Uh, my team has access to people in, in all the faculties. They talk to the key people. They talk to the vocal people in all the faculties. If somebody has a problem, we know about it because they get sent to us. And that really does start. We're, and we're not just there to solve the technical problem. We're, the group is really about going and finding, well, what are you trying to do? What's the interesting thing that you need to do in your teaching and learning? And also there's tools for that, but let's learn about what kind of things are we doing in our 14 faculties at half a dozen campuses around, around Calgary and around the world. 
so being active in supporting the pedagogy and technical support, being active with faculty and university leadership, um, sharing the successes. We have a, uh, a, an EDU blog, so we focus on what kinds of things are we doing and how does it connect to what faculties are doing and how does it connect to the scholarship of teaching and learning. Making those connections is essential so they don't just see that we're off you know, doing our own thing off on the, the corner of campus. What we're doing is important. The other thing that's really going to help for us shift that is we're moving from what was basically leftover space in our biological sciences building. The educational development unit is on the fifth floor. It's the far corner of campus. Nobody actually comes here because who thinks to go there? Um, but we're in this, this time next year, we'll be in our new building that is dead center on campus, right next to the students union in the food court, uh, right next to the engineering and the science complex. And being central is going to make coming to us not, well, where is this place? Why would I go? No, it's the big place right in the middle and you want to go there because it's a good place to work um, and really supporting the community model we don't just do our workshops here we do uh, our, our learning and instructional design group does workshops on course design on teaching online we don't just do them here in our office we go out to the faculties we do them online we do them blended we provide instructional skills workshop again we offer some in our, in our offices here they're also offered out in the faculties we're building capacity out there so we work with our uh, our, our business school and they actually offer them within their faculty they don't have to come to us anymore They're, they've got their their people trained to do that so that's really the model we're actively building community we're building capacity out in, in the community and making sure that we aren't seen as the only people with the answers our job is to connect people and, and ideas and I think that goes a long way and especially with the sort of top-down having the support knowing that we have support even from the president all the way down mm -hmm. uh, that, that, it opens a lot of doors for us. We're not trying to you know, beg to be included in stuff. The problem is we, we have everybody lining up to talk to us now, which is never a problem we had before. So. Um, we've got 12 minutes left, it looks like, and I wanted to touch on two things with you before, because this is my chance to try and get you fired. <laughs> um, so my so, name is Irfan Sarathia. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a two-part question, but I want to get the whole thing out, and then you can answer it as, as you see fit. But what if you have somebody who wants to be the innovator and wants to do something that's pedagogically sound but um, maybe goes against the grain at the university in terms of what administration wants? Mm -hmm. And the other one is you've got somebody who wants to be innovative and maybe they've got like your support and, and, and the institution as a whole is, is okay, but their peers around them um, are opposed to it. And so they're actually getting some pushback about that, how do you, how do you, how do we support uh, those people? Well, the big thing is looking at what's the the evidence, what's the scholarship? Is what we're trying to do founded in good practice? Is it you know, has there been research to show similar practices are relevant or important or interesting, or do they improve learning? And what I've found, so in a, in a previous life, I was an IT partner, which is a role where we I liaise between IT and deans and several faculties. And they kind of push back on some things, but as soon as you have the data to show that what you're doing is relevant, interesting, engaging, and you can show, you, you, you can't argue the data. So that's kind of our mantra here. Everything has to be evidence-informed, evidence-based. Uh, we don't just do stuff because we want to. Um, and that's sort of, if I was to talk with an instructor who wanted to do some radical new thing, I'd say, fantastic. Is it, does it make sense? If it makes sense, we'll build the case and we'll support that however we can. However we can, we'll find ways to support that. If it doesn't make sense, well, that's a different conversation. Why would you do that? Um, so yeah, going back to the to the evidence and does it make sense? Is it the right thing to do? If it is, I've never found that being a problem. That might be naive, but if it's the right thing to do, it gets done. I haven't been fired yet, so. <laughs> so what about at the the? more local level for people within their departments when they they want to take on something that is evidence-based and pedagogically sound but it's different um, how do you how do you help support them through any pushback they might get from either colleagues or students on that yeah well even so we had a prof and I won't name faculties even but uh, this, this instructor wanted to redesign their course from something that was very didactic, right? Here's the content material. Week one is chapter one. Week two is chapter two. So it's always been taught. Let's not rock any boats. Let's just keep doing that. And the instructor realized it sucks teaching it. It's boring for me. 
sucks for the students because they're not learning anything. And so they wanted to redesign their entire course to be essentially throw out half of the content, focus on the key content, make the rest of the course about projects. So this was a, uh, and students, it was an under, undergrad course. They weren't asked, at this time, hadn't been asked to do that. And so peers in that department were like, what are you doing? You're going to kill yourself. This is crazy. They're going to expect to do interesting things in my class. Don't don't rock the boat. <laughs> and luckily, the instructor was strong enough to say, you know what, this is the right thing to do, and this is why. And they went, again, to the evidence. Here's the scholarship of teaching learning that shows collaborative group projects engages, engages students. It enhances learning. And people grumbled still, but the objections kind of fell away. And then providing support. How can we support this so that if you're doing group projects with 300 students, that you're not spending 19 hours a day just doing that and then doing your research and your other stuff. So finding ways, in this case it was tools and even, uh, some of them weren't even technology tools. It was like, have a, uh, a science fair to share your stuff. Well, how can we support that? Let's find the poster boards to, to do that. So, I don't I, I used to think it was subversively supporting, but no, screw it. Let's just support. If you're doing something that's interesting and relevant and the right thing to do, we will find a way to support you so that you don't kill yourself doing it. And we can help find the, the evidence in the scholarship of teaching and learning to help support that, to build your case so that the naysayers don't have anything that can shut you down. So provide the support, give you the ammunition you need to do the right thing. I think that, that's, that's a good way to do it. That's great. Um, I love that science fair idea. Yeah, it was cool. And these these yeah. were students who, I mean, they'd never been asked to make stuff. Usually the, the big science posters are, that's grad level stuff. And yeah. these were students in a 300 level course, which is a second or third year here. And they were doing that. Let's, here's the research project we did, here's what we learned, and communication skills, presentation skills. And they got to see what all the other students did in, in the class. Really, really cool. That's great. Not high tech either. That's great. Um, we've got about a little bit more than five minutes left. Ryan, do you have anything that you wanted to um, I was wondering if, so we, what we've talked about is kind of at the university or higher ed level, um, kind of thinking more K to 12, so thinking of a lot of people in our, our course. Would you have maybe any different things to suggest or different considerations when you're thinking of K to 12 versus university students? Yeah, well, that's interesting. So university students, it's basically adult learning, right? So you can assume that they're going to be responsible, they're going to, you know, and if they go off and they're Googling something in class, whatever, you're paying to be here, you're grown up. Um, so, but even that, we still get profs saying, well, we can't use wireless in class because they're going to Facebook. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm just going to kill my phone. Uh, there we go, I think I did. Oh, sorry, <laughs> just hung up on somebody. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> but how, how is this different in K 12? I think. The, I talked about the responsibility because you're compelling students. That's even stronger in K-12 to because they don't have the option to drop the course or to not show up that day or whatever. So I think it's very important to keep in mind what you're asking students to do. Um, but also there's this weird thing that I don't know what happens in K-12. to I mean, I've got my Bachelor's of Ed. I did my practicum, but I haven't actually taught in K-12, to so I don't know what the... Uh, but it seems like a lot of these things are kind of, you know, I went to the teacher's convention and I saw the thing and I'm going to integrate. Now I'm an awesome innovating teacher. Look at all this fancy stuff I'm using. And so they've got smart boards with whatever, and but it's not fundamentally different than just using a whiteboard and handing markers around. So if you're going to use tech, and I don't think this is specific for K-12, if you're using technology or if you're using anything, make sure that it's adding to what you're doing and not just... It, it's meaningfully adding to what you're doing and not just adding another shiny thing to say that, yes, I've used my professional development dollars. Um, so keep definitely keep in mind sort of the power relationship. What are you forcing the students to do? What control do they have? Um, and the things that you're trying, how do they meaningfully add? I would say go back, to, again, back to the evidence, the scholarship. What are you trying to do and how is it changing changing learning as opposed to just here's another shiny thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Fatih. And I, so my my background, I taught high school for like five years. And yeah, you you come back from a conference and it's like oh, I saw this and this and this, and okay, I'm gonna try all these things out. And you don't really, you know, I, I didn't really spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, what what sorts of you know terms of service are we just like you know signing up for here? And you know, there's well, a lot of so the experimentation, the exploration is 
I think that's critical too. So I don't want to say don't try a new thing. Absolutely <laughs> try new things. Like, so we're also setting up what we're calling a faculty design studio here, which is a room that's going to be full of the shiny stuff. It's going to have you know 3D printers and tablets and you know whatever. We're going to have green screens to do videos. It's not about that. It's a place where, where people can come and try stuff and be exposed, and then they can make decisions on, well, is this something interesting that I can use in my class? If they don't have exposure to these things, they can't make those decisions in an informed way. So we need to provide exposure. We need to, It's basically a literacy thing. We need to provide exposure to these things so people understand what are the affordances, what does it actually mean to have access to a 3D printer or a scanner or whatever. Um, and then finding connections to the scholarship of teaching and learning. How does this stuff support learning? Does it support learning? Or is it just, you know, somebody had a good ad and it was shiny, or somebody knows the uh, the purchasing person person at the university and we got a site like, uh, how, is, how are these decisions made? Um, I think that you need to try these things out and make informed decisions. And especially these days, there's so many tools that all do really, really, really similar things. Well, there's fatigue, right? There's so many things, and you keep trying so this new thing this week, and next week it's going to be something, oh, how is that different than the last thing? Why are we doing that? <laughs> so yeah. being really mindful about what you're doing and how much change you're putting in there, that was one of our big learnings from the D2L transition. We, were, we had changed within a one-year period every key learning technology platform at the University of Calgary, our online class system, our LMS, our everything changed. Uh, at the same time, they also changed email from posted on campus to Office 365 for students. So everything was changing. People got fatigued. They're like, okay, enough. Can we just stop now? Let's take a year. Don't change something. And so be, be mindful of that, how much stuff is changing on these people. Yeah. Well, even in this class, we've, we'll have we'll be working on Evernote, and somebody starts talking about OneNote, and now Ryan and I are scurrying off to see, hmm, does this do what we want it <laughs> the same <laughs> stuff that Evernote does for us? Um, and so even even us, it's tempting to just keep trying things that that everybody new stuff that people mentions to us, um, even though we, you know we're we're raving about I've got this and it's great and I don't need anything else and then somebody <laughs> something shiny as you said comes across our path and we're we're tempted. <laughs> but then the, on the other side, he's like, well, if you don't have any change, you're going to be like the the disgruntled burnout. Get off my lawn! I just work <laughs> fine, right? So. <laughs> You still need to have the sense of play and exploration and trying new stuff, but not just randomly. It has to be for, yeah. you know, with intent. And I, and I think maybe a key takeaway from that is, right, think of that intent. Think of kind of that experimenting before you bring it to the students, perhaps. Yeah. 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 Well, that's why Absolutely. we were trying to do our faculty design studio within our educational development unit. It's not something that's... We, we have a similar thing already set up for students in our digital Taylor Family Digital Library. Students can go play with 3D printers and video editing and all this stuff. Instructors aren't going to go there because it's not a safe place for them to experiment and fail. Mm -hmm. So we need to provide a place for them to try, to play, to make stuff that sucks because the first few things you make with something suck. Mm -hmm. um, so where can they go and do that without you know all the students seeing that? They need a safe place to explore. That's that's great. I love that idea. I really love that. Okay. Um, it's 10:59 Saskatchewan time, which I think is also now Alberta time, right? Alberta time too, yeah. <laughs> All right. As of Sunday, we for those who don't know who are watching, we crazy people in Saskatchewan don't change the clocks. <laughs> so there is no daylight savings time or spring bit forward fall back. Um, so we've shifted a bit. Anyway, it now it's eleven. So um, I want to thank Darcy for joining us. And all of you who tuned in to watch, and we did have a number of people who did, um, and we had some questions come in on Twitter and on the discussion forum. Next week our plan is to have a panel. Uh, we have to see if this is going to work out with people sending us um, uh, volunteering to be on the panel. We're going to try and bring in people from the online course as well as from our face-to-face -face, uh, cohort and we'll see how that goes and hopefully we'll be having another Google Hangout next week and that will be the last one of the course. Ten weeks will have already gone by. and It's been fabulous. Um, so that's, that's it for this week. And, we will see you next week, and thanks again, Darcy. All right. Thank you. Yes, All right. Thank you, Darcy. So just put, putting that out there again, so next week's Hangout, if you are actually wanting to be in the Hangout with us, that's a possibility. So send, uh, send us a message either on uh, Canvas or on Twitter, and we'll see if it'll all work out. But yeah, we're looking for people to actually hang out with us. Yeah, so <laughs> be the Darcy and, and such. We're going to try and get a few people in. 
and it's Ryan. What time did we say? Is it Eastern? Two is it two p.m. Eastern? Uh, yes. yes. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. So let us know if you're interested. Okay. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.